Let's talk about the sweaters, okay? Let David, let's start with you, because I love it. I love it, <laughs> David. I f love that I, sweater. I decided to up my sweater game for Jamath. This is Tom I Ford. Love it. Tom it's Ford. Tom Ford. The buttons are made out of endangered rhino horn. <laughs> 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 we just lost a third of the audience. <laughs> So my sweater oh. is, a, is a very light Italian cashmere made by a company called Doriani, Doriani Cashmere. Uh, this I right thought we here weren't doing plugs for our startups. This is how we're monetizing the all-in pod. Yeah. Here we go. Dorian Cashmere yeah. just got a free. Now this right here, this right here is a, a little uh, young calf leather. Very <laughs> soft, very soft. And the buttons, uh, like David's, uh, are made from shark fin. <laughs> and for those of you at home who would like to spend $150 and stay warm, may I recommend the marine layer? You can find <laughs> it on way. Union Street Jacket. I you, mean, how you can also how find that jacket on Turk Street. <laughs> how tilted uh, is Sweater Karen listening to this? Sweater Karen, if you're listening, <laughs> Sweater Karen. I mean, you must <laughs> never reveal. Sweater Karen got back to me and she was like, oh my God, he's so tilted. I think I know who she is. Sweater yeah. Karen can kiss my brown ass. Oh, so I, Jade comes home last night. I kid you not. She's like, you, I, I don't like you in the t shirts. Uh, I got you some sweaters. And I was, you know, we're going to the mountains for the, for the holiday. And I was like, did you watch the podcast about the sweater? She's like, no, I don't listen to your podcast. I was like, okay, fair enough. Um, and I'm like, I'm looking at these things. They're all in these boxes. And she's got this bunch of sweaters. I started opening up. I was like, what did you spend on this? She said $3,000. I was like, I'm not comfortable spending $3,000 on a sweater. That's half a sweater. Let alone eight of them. And she goes, no, no, it's 3000 for all eight. Yeah, Chamath is like, is that a sleeve? That's uh, it's like, it's like it's four buttons for all eight sweaters. <laughs> four buttons and a waistband? That, that might be a vest for Jamal. <laughs> I, th I think that's the box the sweater came in with 3000 So I got oh my, my three-quarter zip, and I'm feeling good. I'm feeling really oh good. I feel God. pretty sexy in it, I'll be honest. Let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sack. Hey everybody, hey everybody, welcome to the All In Podcast. Yes, breaking into the top 50 podcasts week after week because of you, the amazing audience, telling your it's friends been, about the It's been two pod. weeks, so it's week <laughs> and week. <laughs> All right, week, that's what I said, week after week. week a week and a week. After week. A week and a week. For two it's weeks, more accurate. hitting the top 40 podcast uh, episodes in the world. Thanks to the fans with me, of course, the dictator himself in a uh, amazing sweater. Light, light cashmere gilet. The <laughs> sultan of science, I found out from his mom, he, she much prefers the sultan of science to queen of quinoa, so that's what we're going with going forward. David Freeberg, who had a great party uh, up in uh, Beep, and I really enjoyed going, <laughs> and Sachs, who didn't go to Beep's party or to Friedberg's party, he stayed home and played chess on his iPhone. The rain man himself, David Sachs. Welcome to the pod, everybody. Okay, you want and my two New York stories? My one true bestie, Jason Calacanis. It's true. No, that's not true. I, I really wanted to come, but Nat's breastfeeding, and so I couldn't come. The helipad was shut down. Chamath couldn't land. You were getting breastfed? <laughs> 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 oh, <God. laughs> oh, God. Uh, there was like, was there a curb your enthusiasm? Oh, no, it was um, this great show called Afterlife from Ricky Gervais. There's literally a scene in it where a woman, they work for a local newspaper that's going out of business, and they're going to do local stories. And the big story in town is a woman is making pudding, uh, incredibly delicious pudding, and it's from her breast milk. <laughs> and they go and cover the story. Anyway, I'll just leave it at that. It's a pretty amazing story. Do you want to know my two New York stories or not? Yeah, let's hear it. What were you said you had a helicopter story? What's that? Yeah, helicopter story. Helicopter is also a New York story. So okay. uh, I uh, went to Deepdale to play golf with uh, a certain well-known individual. And uh, we, chop her, we chop her back. A finance individual? Uh, politics. Media? Well-known political oh, individual. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. political. Okay. So this is not a rock and roller. You do not want to step... Foot in a helicopter with a rock and roll so, star. No, but so here, so here's my story, which is why I, I I totally freaked out about helicopters, and I can't. This was eight years ago. We played Deep Dale, which is just you know outside New York. Get in this, the chopper lands in the middle of the thing. I was like, okay, that's fine, you know. And we're going, and I'm already feeling kind of skittish. I don't like helicopters. Get to the East Side Heliport, and the East Side Heliport is basically right by the East River, and so yep. 
the helicopter descends and one of the skis doesn't actually land on the fucking Oops. thing. And so he do it does a little tilty poops and then the guy comes back up and then he lands. You I honestly like I that is, have never been more scared in my life. All right, that's it. We're and I was a like bestie that's band. it. Never again. I don't again. want any besties. It's a bestie band for life for making a pact here. Nobody in fucking It's, cr it's crazy. So that's my one New York story. Next, last New York story was I was there 2 days ago or for the last couple of days. For Santa in the Con? middle of the, in the middle of this Omicron breakout. Uh n by the way, had a beautiful dinner uh after the game draymond kevin Durant, me bunch of friends did you go to the game uh, no we went to the private room at carbone it was so brutal though i have to tell you i feel so disgusting with myself i had a work dinner and i have sushi at the work dinner and then you know dre texts after the game he's like hey look, we're all having dinner at carbone i said okay I'll, I'll head through i went to the hotel i called nat and i said i'm brushing my teeth and she said but you're going out. And I said, yes, but if I brush my teeth, I'm not going to eat a second, second dinner. dinner. And yeah. I thought, you know, and then, but you I made the key bone. mistake, uh -oh. but I didn't floss. So I was unflossed, but I brushed my teeth. Okay. I show up and fucking, I lose it. And yes. wine and dessert and uh, bread and pasta, pasta, pasta. Vodka? Uh -oh. uh, it was really brutal. Uh -huh. And by 3 a.m. I stumble home and I felt so bad because I had to wake up at like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning no my first meeting was at 7 45 well congratulations to Steph I, Curry, by the way incredible no the he's greatest shooter he, of all time he, he's a virtuoso yeah anyways that was my that was my new york story yeah i i gained you know here's my here's my one kilo. i gained one kilo 2.2 pounds i gained wow. in two days uh here's my carbone story hardest thing to hardest reservation to get in new york Sachs is like jake i'll need to help me a favor what's the best place in new york to do a closing dinner i'm like i got you i got my guy Get my guy on the horn. My guy's like, okay, I got you. Carbone, Friday fucking night, eight o'clock, hardest ticket in New York. You know what Sax does? Goes dark. Friday <laughs> afternoon, 1 p.m. He's like, yeah, we're not going to make it. <laughs> I'm like, oh my, God. my friend is like, J Cal, your guy burned the Carbone res? That was the bird IPO. I was going to take the founder out to dinner that night at Carbone, and then it turned into like the big group dinner with like 30 people. So it moved over to. Well, Brooklyn by the way, the, 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 the private room, which is like, you know, not in the restaurant, but it's like a little bit on the side. It only fits like 15, 20 people. Mm. So it's not like you, you can, and, and that's, that's, then it's really tight. How, how what, let me ask you a question. What was Steph's, uh, how did Steph feel? Uh, no, Steph wasn't there. Draymond, oh. Kevin, me. Benny Fowler, Morale, but just a bunch of our You friends. say Kevin, Kevin Durant? Yeah. Kevin Durant still oh, friendly with uh He's honestly Bayless. he's he's such a great guy. I love Kevin Durant. He's a, he, he, he really he is really, really, really a great guy. Wish he had stayed. Super, super sensitive, cool. He's friends again with uh yeah, he was Day -Day. always All good. He was always yeah. he was always yeah, I mean, I think great. that when they had their blow up, it was more like their brothers and it was just a little bit like of when you started talking like Joe Pesci. <laughs> Did, did Kevin Durant ever start talking like Joe Pesci? <laughs> hey, inside baseball. All right. Uh, it was an eventful week on Twitter. We're only one week into the new Twitter CEO's reign. Jack is gone. And already, David Sachs has been flagged. <laughs> it's a guy. It can't be a coincidence that you were talking about them flagging accounts at the end of free speech. And then uh, <laughs> pull it up on the screen, everybody. Investors should be spending their time finding good investments, not endlessly debating interest rates, inflation, and tax policy. But that's the uncertainty Washington has created. It's a great tweet. Uh, I like that tweet, actually. And then the flag, the conversation from Sachs has been flagged. Some conversations can get heavy. Don't forget the human behind the screen. Do you think that this is that's machine learned? Or do you think that that's a, an editor that goes in there and actually just manually learned. flags? Machine learned. No, I, th sure. I think it's a great question. But what is but what is in there that actually triggers we're debating Washington interest rates, tax debating? policy, Washington? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that you could build. Or uh, maybe it's the ratio. I don't. I don't know how you would build a function that would weight this in a way where this could get flagged of all the things you could say with those words. This is so benign. Well, I think it's the kind of. It seems to me this thing's trying to ward off bullying attacks on Sachs, which I don't think Sachs needs to be too worried about. All oh, right, because they're telling this to people who would reply. You're saying it's there to protect me. 
It's to protect you. It's one of those things where they're like trying to get people to not insult you in the comments. They're talking about that. Maybe you get a lot. Do you get a, do you get a lot of insults and comments on your tweets? Oh, undoubtedly. But so it could just uh, be a but, blanket. But this, tweet, yeah. this, this this tweet's comments section were, was pretty benign. Oh, right. It may not be about the tweet. It might be about the replies. No, so it might be that see, you're this getting... wasn't that hot. This wasn't that hot. Huh. I think Jamoth might be onto something. You know, Michelle Tandler got the same label around the same day for a tweet that seemed totally innocuous too. Mm. So what I wonder about is, you know, is this label to protect us or is it a way, is it sort of a passive aggressive way for snowflakes at Twitter to like label <laughs> people they don't like and sort of suggest they're vaguely disreputable? <laughs> I don't think it's that. I don't think it's you that. Think it's, that. It's, a right, it's a left wing conspiracy. It's, it's, the, it's the libs going after the, the, no, the no, right no. The sacks. Uh, You're paranoid. I haven't seen any liberals getting, I haven't seen any like, Actually, left wing people wait getting a There seems to be way. a blanket attempt at trying to kind of mute the tone a little bit across the, the debating that happens and the comments that come across in the replies. And I think they're mm. just trying to like get everyone to tone it down a bit. I and maybe like it's really this way before you tweet it. It'd be really one. interesting to know whether this was algorithmic or it was editorial. Because I think if it's editorial, it does actually, I don't think it's as extreme as what David just said, but it skews more in the realm of like people with an axe to grind can flag one thing over another or not, right? But if it's algorithmic, I think that that algorithm probably just needs a lot of tweaking because it's not Well, very anyway, good. this... Doesn't it say that there's a person behind the tweet? It's like trying to get people to not say... The war, there's nothing wrong with the warning. The warning things. is charming. The warning's charming. charming. Be nice to each other. It's, it's, tr it's trying ridiculous. to get you to be nice to each other. It's ridiculous. It's like your mom inserting herself and being like, now remember. It's, it's there to nice. suggest that there might be something wrong with the content that's being posted. Well, you know in what? Other words, in other words, the content is so triggering that, you know, it needs warning labels. Do you guys think that paternalism has a role on social networks to try and mollify the, the kind of discourse being too acrimonious? Like... I think we need some some of the transparency that Jack Dorsey repeatedly promised at all the congressional hearings. Remember when he got hauled up there, he promised that they would give more transparency about the way that their algorithms worked. Where is that? And mm -hmm. it hasn't been delivered up. They promised it. Now Jack Dorsey's skipped out of town and there's a new guy in charge. Uh, well, we need to know how these algorithms work because they are pressing their thumb on the scale you know, of debate in the marketplace of ideas by suggesting that some ideas are sketchier than others. They should just put here, this was algorithmically done based on, they should explain it. Under, or there should be a little question mark, you hover the question mark, based on the words in the thread, it feels like things are getting heated here, we did this with an algorithm. Or, users reported this as a heated thread, so we put this here. Or, a human We decided. Did. No, we decided. We decided, yeah. But you want it to be an open marketplace of ideas, but the fact is, it's Twitter's marketplace of ideas. Yeah. And Facebook's is Facebook's marketplace of ideas. And at the end of the day, I don't think you're going to get away from any of these centralized social networks having anything but some degree of moderation to play a role in- In a related to, thing, they didn't just target Saks. Also, Chamatha, you didn't see this, but uh, they flagged one of your tweets uh, just this afternoon. Pull it up. As you can see here, it's a slightly <laughs> different one. Uh, it says, layers are for players. This conversation will drift to $5,000 sweaters. So a big warning for Chabot uh, to just, and for the people replying, be careful. This well, that, that, must be, that must be, then that must have been human, uh, you know, That's human, human initiated. For sure. And uh, this one came in for Prof G. Another one came in for Prof G. So, and in this case, I think they're actually trying to think about uh, <laughs> the public good. This guy is full of shit. <laughs> He thought JC Penny would beat Amazon. <laughs> uh, how many how many hours of Masterclass Adobe Photoshop did you take to, to get this <laughs> I little joke? For my, I didn't make these. My meme team did. I'm convinced you that there's two team. ways to raise your next fund in Silicon Valley. One, have one of the top 50 podcasts in the world. Or two, have a strong meme game. And I'm going for both. Sax so, now has a warning on his. And this yeah. one, they put on your profile page. Sax, yeah, read this it. was crazy. Warning, this Ooh. person has interesting things to say. If you if you're too interesting, you get labeled now. It's really crazy. <laughs> no, I saw Jake. Control. I saw Jake having too much fun with this, and I'm like, I gotta get in on this act. <laughs> you're like, I need a meme team. Yeah, I'm exactly. literally. If anybody out there, I don't care if you're. A, I need a comedian. I'm. I'm willing to pay on a pay per meme, a pay per viral, whatever it takes. Okay. Uh, in a related story, Democrats want racial equity audits at tech companies, according to the Washington Free Beacon. Uh, which Sachs, correct me if I'm wrong, that's some sort of wacky right-wing uh, publication. Uh, Never heard of it. 
Okay. Washington Free Beacon. If instituted orders would have veto power over every product or initiative, that's not an exaggeration is what the story says. One proposal from House Democrats would fine companies 20000 a day for not completing biennial independent racial equity audits. A left-wing nonprofit called Color of Change is pushing for these audits. Last week, their president called for independent auditors to vet new products from tech companies before they're released in front of Congress. 2018 Color of Change successfully pushed Facebook into completing an audit. They called for more restrictions on Trump's posts. Color of Change itself pushed for Trump to be permanently banned from the platform. Just so you know, this is exactly the, the, the rough version of what happened to Microsoft in their DOJ settlement, their antitrust settlement was effectively an oversight where lawyers at the DOJ were the product managers and had not effectively veto right, but you had to approve product features <laughs> before you could push them for 10 years. You know, this is essentially what caused Bomber's reign to be so, you know, ignominious. It's like he couldn't do anything because like you had, you had a plan to do something and you'd have to go to these random folks who didn't really have the context to make a, a, a decision one way or the other on features. So, I mean, the idea that they would do this is a pretty, it's pretty crazy. I need a point of clarification here. I've heard the term uh, racial audits or racial equity audits. My understanding of those were to understand the composure of the company uh, in terms of, you know, the diversity in the company. But this is something different. This is in the product to make sure the product isn't racist. Can products be racist? What's an example of a product being racist? I don't understand what they would find. Let me unpack this for yeah, you. Please. Okay. What they are basically saying is that these big companies, and for example, they've called on Google to ha conduct one of these audits. They want all these big companies to conduct these audits. These so called auditors are actually political consultants who are uh, members of the Democratic Party, who are friends of the senators who are pushing for this. They're political activists. Oh, it's a grift. And it's partly a grift, but it's more than that because. You know, when you conduct an audit, let's just take this word audit for a second, okay? You bring in a big five accounting firm and they will check your numbers according to generally accepted accounting principles, GAP, and make sure that the numbers are what you purported them to be. That is the purpose of an audit. And if the auditor ever says that you've done anything wrong, like you have to fix it, there's no choice, or you can appeal to some other auditor and have them redo the work, okay, according to these generally accepted principles. With an equity audit, what exactly are the principles that are being enforced or checked here? There is no generally accepted list of equity principles that must be enforced these companies. Basically, you have to do whatever this political activist tells you to do. I mean, it's essentially like bringing in a party commissar to now take over the hmm. company or at least be inside the company telling the executives and officer of the company what to do. It's something that, frankly, the CCP would do. It does feel a little like, uh, yeah, Stasi-like. Didn't we have all of the companies uh, on their own, from Twitter to Google to Facebook, release their own diversity stats years ago? I think this and is about more than diversity. It's about equity. It's about equity. So, okay, so let's explain the difference in what that means. This is somehow well, how the I companies mean, run, like uh, the day-to-day -day life of the employees there, not just the composure and the breakdown of the employees? Look, equity equity means anything that progressives say it means. We've seen on this program before how equity has jumped the shark. There's now, uh, there's a provision in the infrastructure bill for tree equity. So, I mean, really any disparity that occurs that progressives don't like can now be called a violation of equity. And this gives them the authorization to come in there and start giving orders. Hmm. It's very weird that it, I don't understand how the product then review gets stopped. Well, Is that maybe, meant to throttle you from releasing product as a punitive? Let me give you an example. So Please, recently, yeah. you know, I wrote a, a piece called the, the no buy list where I basically you had companies like PayPal and some of these other financial firms were starting to deny service to customers, to users based on their political affiliations and not just like people who are in, you know, well-known hate groups that like everybody sort of, you know, issues and wants to stay away from. But these are people with relatively down the middle conservative, you know, conservative groups, and they were being denied service by, you know, fintech firms. So now I'm not saying that this is what this means, but if this equity auditors tells you, well, look, I don't think it's equitable to allow these conservative groups to you know, be a user of your product, well, what's the company going to do? They're going to have to listen to that. And, and that, that is a plausible scenario, given that it's already occurred. We've, all, we've, we've said this so many times on the pod, but I just want to say it again, because I guess a lot of folks are new and listening. 
Whenever you hear equity used by a politician, it usually means there's a power grab involved. Yeah. Because if you really want things to be fair, you want things to be um, equal. Meritocracy. Right? You want equality. But whenever you start throwing the word equity around and say, we want racial equity, it's a bunch of, you know, a small number of people who, you know, basically have and live by what I, you know, what's often called luxury beliefs, who want to judge other people, who want to be morally absolutist, and then who want to basically like, uh, you know, exercise a power grab. And we have to push back on that stuff because it, it's just a slippery, slippery slope. Well, this also seems like overbearing red tape for companies. I mean, if the company has no problems, no complaints against it, you know, releases their diversity numbers, like, what is the point of going no, in there let, and auditing let's, them? Let's use let's use an example that builds on what David said. Let's take Square. Okay, one of the one of the most incredible things that Square did was in a hackathon, essentially, build a cash app. Yeah. And one of the most incredible things that happened in the cash app was that it really started to blow up in urban communities. Okay. Yep. And it starts to normalize banking, opening up bank accounts, having more savings, understanding, you know, an on ramp into crypto, you know, cash app has probably done more to get black and brown people into crypto and to save money and to understand their cash than almost anybody else as as like a almost explicit strategy. And so is somebody supposed to go in there and just, you know, arbitrarily judge whether there's too many white people that work at Square or not enough black people. And so XYZ thing has to change or such and such a feature doesn't actually speak to folks. So you can't do it. It's insanity. It's like well, also to, to your point, Sachs, is what, what are the what, what do these people know? Like, what is their qualification and what, where, what's the goal? Right. And, and to build on Shamas point, if these senators, so I think Cory Booker was the one who proposed this. If these senators want those specific policies implemented in the Fortune 500, let them pass a bill to do it and let all of our elected representatives vote on that bill. Mm -hmm. And then we can see if it'll really, if it's popular enough to pass and whether it passes constitutional muster. They won't do that because these bills, if they were directly concretized in the form of proposals, would be very legs. unpopular. So they instead, legs. what they do is tell you, well, we're not going to do this directly. We're going to put pressure on these big companies to hire one of our political friends, again, this like commissar like person, and empower them to tell these companies what to do. So it's it's really kind of insidious what they're doing. And they're kind of covering it all up with these nice sounding names. I mean, who could be against a racial equity audit, right? Because racists. <laughs> yes, if you're if you're against it, you you're must racist, be yeah. a racist and you must not believe in auditing companies. Right. Right. So there's this word to, game. You have to you just it's a word game. It's it's using words that are really loaded and mean a lot to a lot of us right if i hear racism and race my ears triggering, perk up. Yeah. it's not triggering but my ears perk up and i have i have a lot of inbuilt opinions on it that have been governed by 45 years as living as a as a brown man and so mm -hmm. okay it stands to reason that i'm going to pay attention but on the surface if you say racial equity audit it also doesn't seem actually all that bad it seems like reasonably benign and that seems like an okay thing to do it's just that most of us then stop at that point and move on. Right. But if you actually look at the rules, again, I would just say whenever political frameworks use the word, we need to create more equity, mm. the outcomes are horrible. For example, look in healthcare. You know, if you, we have used this idea of healthcare equity, health equity, and we've misused it to such a degree. And all we see is that now the system is so perverted. It also doesn't work for the majority of people that have actually had the healthcare system work for it, right? Like at the top of the pecking order has always been white men have always gotten the best care. And we've always measured our healthcare progress in America based on the longevity of men, white men, you know, 78, 79, 80 years old. And then it started to degrade and people were curious what was happening. And underneath it all was just a bunch of power grabs. Under the realm of equity, we passed all these crazy laws. We basically didn't do anything to really create more accountability and a cost based system. Mm. And here we are. So at some point, when the citizenry hears that word, you're going to have to put your thinking cap on and actually take the opposite view, which is hold on, this is a really nice sounding word. It may not be what I think it is. And I got to pay attention because more than if I didn't hear the word at all, anything you have uh, on race, Friedberg, <laughs> representing <laughs> uh, South Africans. Fundamentally, I, I don't think this is about race, Jake. I think this is about power. Power. It's, it's a power. power. It feels like a power grip. Also, it feels like a little. Gri it feels like a little bit of a grift. I know I had heard on the back channel that a lot of the people who are criticizing some big tech companies who were getting 
you know, I'm not going to say who or under what moniker. Sweater, sweater Karen? Not it sweater, sweater Karen, Karen. But there was a group of people who are like attacking big tech. Sweater Karen, if she has an opinion on sweater, she must have an opinion on racial equity. Come on. Okay, enough. Leave Sweater Karen out. The issue is um, they would complain and create these, you know, basically, you know, Twitter mobs. And then they'd say, oh, yeah, and hire us for $20,000. We'll come in and fix the problem for you. So they were creating the <laughs> Twitter mob so to brutal. then come in and solve the problem. <laughs> That's so and brutal. And I was like, oh, wow, that is. That's yeah. so brutal. That's that so, so dirty. No, it's, I mean, these HR so consultants dirty. who've written these books, like on the, was it uh, D'Angelo or whatever on white fragility and, the, you know, how, how to be an anti-racist. I mean, they're all making a fortune in corporate fees, you know, charging twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 per per gig. I mean, it is absolutely a racket. I'm not a fan of equality of outcome. I'm more a fan of equality of opportunity. And I think um, many, many of these sorts of folks, I try and identify methods to drive equality of outcome. And it inhibits the competitive forces that cause the best person, the best idea, the best business, the best market model to win. And, uh, you know, I think it, it's easy to conflate the two when you don't really think through it. But it is certainly appropriate and reasonable to make sure that folks aren't discriminated against when they apply for a job. I don't think it's appropriate to then apply considerations of race and other factors when people are equally in the same job on who gets to have the chance at the bonus. It is the best performer that should have the chance at the bonus. And the same should be true in marketplaces and the same should be true with business. Um, and I think that what we're really seeing is this fundamental effort to try and generate equality and outcomes um, in lots of different manifestations. And we're seeing it more frequently and, and more severely than we've seen it historically. But it's not, uh, I don't think it's the right model. And it's only going to lead to the demise of marketplace dynamics and the things that cause forces for success and progress um, uh, to win. You know, we, um, we mentioned this a couple of times, I'll just say it again. Um, but we are about to have probably the most significant movement and questioning of equity versus equality, um, because I think in the next month, or maybe in the next two months, we're going to sort of see a pretty strict opinion on affirmative action. And uh, if you talk to legal scholars, the overwhelming consensus is this is gone. Um, and, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to rebuild, you know, what was a really important system that tried to give folks at least, you know, getting to the starting line in the same way. But it's not gonna. It's not really gonna exist in this in the same way, shape, or form. Speaking of Karens, uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, was bashing Elon <laughs> over taxes, <laughs> uh, and Elon um, has a Twitter handle um, with some followers, and he responded. Uh, Elizabeth Warren says, "Let's change the rigged tax code so the person of the year will actually pay taxes and stop freeloading off everyone else." Unfortunately for uh, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, Elon Musk is pretty good at Twitter. He replied, and if you opened your eyes for two seconds, you would realize I pay more taxes than any American in history this year. He paid, which is, I, I guess, true. He paid more in taxes now than any American in history. As a side note, Elizabeth Warren has a $12 million net worth, and I saw that she paid no taxes on her equity holdings because she didn't sell anything, which is how the tax code works. <laughs> and uh, Elon then responded, uh, don't spend it all at once. Oh, wait, you already did. <laughs> and then, you know, after the warm up replies, Elon really, you know, uh, got in the zone and, uh, like Steph Curry, just started draining half court shots. He ratioed her every single time. Ratioed her with wow. 50,000 replies. Yeah. You remind me of when I was a kid and my friend's angry mom would just randomly yell at everyone for no <laughs> reason. Please don't call the manager on me. Senator Karen. Elon also responded to Bernie Sanders' uh, tweet today about climate change. Bernie Sanders said, when future generations ask us, what do we do to stop the climate crisis? How will we answer? And uh, Elon said, <clears throat> and so, great tweets. Uh, but to the bigger picture, did these people even know what's going on in the world? <laughs> no, they woke up. They woke up on the wrong side of the tilt bed. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, in in like a 24 hour period, he was the time person of the year, the FT person of the year, and they just went into super mega tilt mode. And the Build Back Better Act got shelved, and he and then, paid and then tax Build Back on Better got shelved, and 
um well i mean you know i think we we talked about this last week but that bill is dead now i mean they pushed it to march to basically avoid a down vote nothing's gonna happen david you're right well, wait a this second. Bill is dead. we said last week wouldn't it be hilarious if elon said kill it and then it got killed well i don't i don't think that that's why the bill is dying i think the real reason is that we now see a fed posture which is actually pretty reasonable mm. which actually says oh wait there's way too much money in the system as it is yeah you know the fed two days ago basically said we're going to see up to three rate hikes next year probably 50 basis points each so you know it's basically acknowledging that these these last you know several years we have printed way too much money and they're trying to fix the problem that they created so that's i think the real reason and then the cbo comes out and basically says the congressional budget office and says this thing is a white albatross that's going to cost way more than you guys think it will and so it puts biden in this very awkward situation which is you know on the one hand he supports powell um and you know he supports institutions or has historically like the cbo but he effectively then has to push back on both of them all in one false soup to try to ram this bill down people's throats and the support is i think it's crumbling and so you know to save face they basically said well we'll put a pin on this and we'll revisit it in march but you guys know what's going to happen in the next three months there's going to be some other crisis most folks will forget and it may just allow them to move on without having to actually deal with the potential of this thing getting defeated which would just be i think cataclysmically bad for Sacks. for democrats you were on cnbc today i thought you said something really important where you said hey listen maybe if we just calm things down for a year we can you know get through i'm not sure what the exact quote was but maybe you could unpack that sentiment you had on cnbc today because i thought that was pretty important yeah well i mean i agree with what chama said this um i mean this this bbb bill was particularly anachronistic once the 6.8 percent you know inflation print came out in other words we're in a hyperinflationary environment and here comes this bill that the cbo says if you know over 10 years would cost five trillion dollars that's the last thing we need is more money printing when you know we've got this inflationary fire out of control so i think that is why the the bill is being shelved probably not to return um, I think that the larger problem that we have in the markets is that just there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty being created right now by Washington. We've had tremendous uncertainty over spending, uh, over taxes, over interest rates. And the conversations that I'm having with friends who are investors in really every asset class, real estate, VC, crypto, the conversations are all the same. What's interest rates going to do? What's the macro picture going to be? I've never seen investors who should be focused on, hey, do I invest in this company or buy this building or whatever? Those aren't the conversations. It's all, everyone's a macroeconomist now. And so we're also distracted by this. And so now the Fed, a couple of days ago, finally gave us clarity. I mean, what they basically said is they're going to um, accelerate the taper. They'll, they'll end quantitative easing at the end of Q1. And then we're basically going to get Explain quarter Explain what that means to people who don't know what they've been purchasing and why. Yeah, I mean, quantitative easing is kind of a weird term. What it means is that the Fed has been going into the bond market and buying bonds. Um, I think basically mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. And they've been buying, I think, about $90 billion a month. They're going to cut that back to $60 billion a month. And uh, that'll continue. Just to explain yeah. it a little bit more, when you do that, what you're doing is you're giving somebody that owns those bonds money. Okay, so the Fed Which prints the money, yeah. the government prints $100, <laughs> takes that $100, steps into the market, and takes something from you, in this case, it's a bond, and gives you that freshly printed $100. What are you going to do? Well, you're probably going to go and spend that. You're going to buy other things. And that's the cycle of inflation that quantitative easing basically creates. And so when you call it, when you talk about tapering, what that means is slowing down the money printing machine and slowing down you stepping in the market and buying assets with money that you've created out of thin air. And it's up right. to other people to buy those assets. If other people see value in them, you you then they you then are them. forced to find the real market clearing price. Yeah, those those bonds are now on the Fed's balance sheet. And so there's a very interesting chart showing assets that are owned by the Fed. And it went up by something like three trillion during COVID. So that is the sort of monetary stimulus that's been pumped into the market over the last couple of years. Separately, we've had something like six or seven trillion of just spending by the government. So, you know, tremendous and amount of- And so that of, three trillion is not thrown away. So we're clear, right. we're going to get interest on that and people, some number will default, some of them will get paid back. 
it's a way of stimulating the economy. But we now know after the uh, stimmy checks, and all the stimulus we did during the pandemic, we don't need to put more fire or oxygen or kerosene on what we got going in this economy. Correct, David? Yeah, I mean, we it, we should show that chart about how much the, the Fed's balance sheet has grown over the last yeah. couple of years. But you know, the the argument I think would be the reason why they do, they buy these assets is if they're buying bonds, it basically means that it keeps the yield down, right? Because if they weren't the ones buying them, someone else would have to buy these bonds to keep the government funded, and they might demand a higher interest rate, a higher yield on the bonds. So. Mm-hmm. This by having the Fed come in and increase the demand for the government's debt, it means that the government can sell its debt more cheaply. Mm-hmm. So when they stop doing that, um, I think you can expect that you know interest rates are going to need to rise in order to make our debt attractive to you know to bond buyers. The other thing, the other thing, by the way, that the Fed did when they did that was it wasn't just government bonds that they were buying; they decided completely arbitrarily um, at one point to start buying certain corporate debt. So they own like Ford debt, GM debt, commercial United paper Airlines. that's called, yeah. No, no, no. That, well, not, I mean, commercial paper is sort of more very short fast term. term, short term duration. But like, how do you make a decision to start buying corporate bonds? It's like buying corporate equities. Do you buy Google versus Facebook? Do you have yeah, a Who's view? the capital allocator making that decision? So and more importantly, who, who's, who's setting the price? Who's setting the price? So, mm-hmm. you know, these guys have been off the reservation for a long time. I think it's fair to say that they were forced into action without a playbook in the middle of a once in a you know lifetime, once a century pandemic. Fair enough. And I think they actually did a pretty reasonable job. But we just kept the tap on for so long. Yeah. And now we're like dealing with this stuff, trying to figure out how do we actually compensate. So the idea that we would add knowing all of this. So it's one thing, I think, if Biden passed the bill five months ago, six months ago, because we didn't know any of this stuff. But to do it now, knowing that, I think that it's really hard. And I bet you that it's not just Manchin on the Democrats that are having a little bit of heartburn and second thoughts. It's probably more because I suspect that they could have forced his hand really if it was just up to him. But I suspect there are other Democrats who are now teetering on the fence thinking I don't want my legacy to be tied to this. When we're printing six, seven, eight percent inflation, for me to basically keep the money printing machine on because it's it's insane. This is like the Sopranos episode where he gave him like, he fronted the guy like 45 boxes of ZD and like you wake up and this guy can't pay the bill on the poker game. Like where can we even afford to pay this back at some point? Yeah, look, I think when, when March comes around and this bill supposedly going to be brought back off the table, we're going to be into the election season in 2022. And I don't know that Democrats are going to want to defend this. Um, mm. I think there is a view on the Democratic side that if they deliver enough goodies to their base, then that will help them win elections. But I think what helps you win elections more than delivering goodies to your special interests is for the economy to be healthy. Yeah. And if they are sort of pressurizing this inflation situation, that is, I think, ultimately, that could backfire. I think that's going to be worse for the economy. Frankly, I think Manchin's doing Biden a favor because if the economy does grow by 4% next year, as the Fed is predicting it is, and if inflation comes down, because you stop printing money the way they're doing, then, you know, I think the Democrats will do better in the election if the economy is good. I mean, one of the reasons why they did so poorly, you know, in the off year election uh, a month ago is that there's tremendous economic anxiety out there. People are seeing the inflation at the gas tank when they go to buy food. And, um, you know, if that continues, I think they're going to do very poorly next year. I wanted to sh- like uh, bring up this chart from Fred on total assets on the Fed balance sheet. I think it is really interesting to look at this thing. Because the, so the, the Fed had about a trillion of assets until 2008. Okay. Then we had the financial crisis and they doubled it. That's when the quantitative easing began. Uh, it went to two trillion. But then from roughly 2009 to about 2020 before COVID, somehow the balance sheet grew from two trillion to four trillion. So, and it had gone to four and a half and they were starting to shed assets. So they were starting to get off drugs, but it was still from two to four trillion. Between this like 2009 and 2020 period, when supposedly we weren't in a crisis. So, you know, they've continued this quantitative easing. Then COVID hits and the amount grows from four to seven trillion just in 2020. And since then, it's gone from seven to a little under nine trillion uh, just in the last, you know, 
Well, they 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 How did we get these things off our books ever? I mean, these are twenty year. Eventually, bonds? they got to sell them. Well, I, either they're going to have to sell the assets, or they can if, do. Well, 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 it's not like that. They they basically are the are the, the Fed is the one who bought the government debt. Mm. So they're buying. Let's call it a ten year treasury. So yeah, I guess they could just wait till the the bond gets paid yeah. off. But um, but I guess they could do that. But but now the Fed has an incentive not to let the assets get toxic, right? So. Uh. If, you know, the assets would get toxic if, you know, if interest rates go up too high, that drives bond prices down. And now all the assets on their books are worth a lot less. Mm. Yeah, um, this is this is like the point where we have to just call it and say, okay, you know what, let's move on. Meaning in the sense that, like, we have to go to these root causes because the money is more money is not going to fix what we're dealing with. So I just put something in the group chat and I just want to get your guys' reaction to it because when I saw it, it blew my mind. There was a study, okay, that was just published a few days ago, and it said the following thing. Children born during the pandemic have experienced a catastrophic drop in cognitive development of 22 IQ points. Yeah, 22. Yeah. And when you look at it, the people that were the most affected were male children and children of lower socioeconomic families. But everybody was affected. Yet you see the amount of money that we're spending already. So adding more money to something is not going to make it better if what we're spending today is basically just getting flushed down the toilet. And these are the kinds of things that really matter. How do you allow an entire generation of kids to see, to see to to suffer? By the way, what does that show? That means that teachers actually are unbelievably important. So number one, they should get paid a lot more. Okay, let's just put it that and way. And there should be more of them and smaller class sizes. Exactly. But if you if you have, you know, these completely screwed up incentives between, you know, the organizations, the unions that represent these teachers, and then the parents who have completely different incentives, and they basically fight to never be in the classroom and to not really teach, this is the measurable outcome. Yeah. The IQ of our children. <laughs> I mean, we their are verbal pushing ability, their executive function, their scores are going down. How do they recover from that? It's gonna be a lot of tutoring. It's gonna be more a lot of Zoom? summer school. Yeah. I mean, Zoom's not gonna do it. I don't think more Fortnite and Roblox fixes this problem. No, definitely not. And and I feel terrible because, like, you know, as a parent, that's that was my solution, right? I was struggling with the Zooms, like every other parent. And then in the evenings, I was just so burnt and just feeling so beside myself in the middle of the pandemic Bef whereas i had a no ipad rule for my kids the i broke down yep you know everybody did i mean it's like everybody you're, did. you're home with your kids all day long it's not how it's supposed to work and but so the yeah. point is like this is where the government should step in and actually say okay here let me take leadership on this topic mm. right and talk to the unions fix whatever needs to be fixed amp up the the money into charter schools do whatever you need to do but please fix the problem but randomly spending money to try to buy votes, I think people see through that. It just doesn't work. And related to that, Omicron is spreading like crazy. Uh, New York City had Omicron. an outbreak. Omicron. <laughs> Omicron. Omicron. There is no N. Omicron. Omicron. Omicron, yes. I'll, I'll learn how to pronounce it when it's gone. Omicron. 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 Uh, is spreading like crazy in new york city and in the uk amongst other places uh, the nba and the nfl are seeing surges i've had a ton of people i know test positive this week you guys had that family friends crazy no, no. it's insane Not how person. many people are i know so many people in new york positive. city he's related yeah and a lot of people that don't have um any symptoms so here's the chart of cases uh cases spiking but uh, hospitalizations and deaths are flat or going down um, in places where these outbreaks are occurring. The UK uh, charts are even starker. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence. Everybody on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter, uh, young people in New York who went to SantaCon are saying they all got it. But if you look sorry, at this but chart- what, what, what is SantaCon? SantaCon is the worst holiday of the year. It's a time when a bunch of young people dress as Santa Claus and get drunk. And you have Sorry, but 10, like it's a bar crawl. It's a bar it's a, crawl. This like is sexy like Santa. Santa? Do you see this? You see how you see how Monty's wearing his Santa outfit? <laughs> oh, Monty that's Claus. What, that's what goes on. Everyone wears their little Santa outfit and they go bar crawling. So it's not sexy Santa. <laughs> well, actually, I have a story about that. I was in San Francisco <laughs> oh my first God. I first moved You were sexy Santa? No. I literally took my daughters out for pizza uh, at Tony's uh, in uh, North Beach. And, you know, I got my three daughters and 
there's all these people walking around like, look, dad, it's Santa Claus, like a lot of them. And so there's a thousand Santa Claus descend on North Beach. And I turn around and I kid you not, there are two old guys. I'm talking 70 years old. And they're wearing a baseball, uh, a Santa hat, Santa boots, and nothing in between. Literally buck naked in on the streets of yeah bro you're you're so you're so demented okay you're like this like like unky perv like every time i get those text messages i don't know what to think <laughs> did you guys click on the twitter link when jason was like guys search for the Folsom street fair on twitter <laughs> i can't i can't unsee what i saw i was like why was is Folsom street trending i was like i thought there was a terrorist attack Bro, that was so brutal. You you should you can't send that shit around. Like it's so brutal. I was like, it's like, guys, oh, don't click oh. on. I was like, don't click on false. I was like, oh, this is a Twitter link. What is it about? Web three point <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. Uh, the Folsom Street Fair. I'm gonna go ahead and say, don't search for that. Um, if you have kids around, it's a little bit intense. Um, but anyway, the uh, SantaCon was on Saturday, December 11th, and so here we are, five days late. You know, four or five days later, and this stuff. Uh, hitting if that's true it almost perfectly mirrors the original outbreak after saint patty's day in march 2020 and if you look on social media all the city md lines uh where people get tested are around the block and 30 nba players have entered the covid protocol in the last two weeks it's about seven percent of the league and uh we had a big question mark of would this be less more contagious it obviously is check less deadly it apparently is some studies show as much as 40 times more infectious than delta um highly contagious extreme very much airborne it's going everywhere uh like i said last time if it does end up having low severity and low um hospitalization rate and low death rate for vaccinated or vaccinated plus boosted populations uh, this could end up being a massive immunizing event meaning like a lot of people will develop new antibodies and resistance and um, you know, that could be a net good thing, but it's certainly the case that this is not a one strain, one shot and done pandemic. This is an endemic kind of circumstance. We're going to be in this for a while. And, um, you know, the circumstances are one that may kind of require, you know, an adaptation in terms of how we live and operate. And especially as it relates to things that are so important, like keeping businesses open in schools. Um, you know, I think we're going to use recent memory to guide future decision making, or at least politicians and you know, kind of lawmakers will and they'll say, Hey, this is what we did last time this happened. And we just saw this in California, where they're like, last time, like we told everyone go into lockdown or wear masks indoors again, and we're seeing that behavior again. Certainly, it, it may have an impact in terms of the spread, but this is highly contagious, and it's going to spread everywhere. And I think there's just some adaptation that maybe is going to be needed here over the long run. There, there's no end. There's no end in sight. There's no end in sight, but uh, it is less deadly, and so it could be mass immunizing, and that has led people to think of this herd immunity, potentially if there's not another variant. Um, Sachs, if the NBA and the NFL are learning to live with COVID, and obviously when we were in Miami, there's no COVID, and Austin, there's no COVID, yeah. is everybody now just go, because it seems like the politicians now, whether it's in Europe, we're seeing the protests, uh, and I, I think we'll see them here in the United States if this keeps up. Australia, obviously, having protests as well. The public has decided, I think, we're willing to have a 1000 people die a day or a certain number of people die today to get back to normal. So wh what do you think the end game here is going into 22? I'll make a prediction for 2022. Okay, I will predict that even the blue areas of the country are going to have fatigue with all these COVID restrictions. And so even the blue state governors who are addicted to their state of emergencies and their restrictions and lockdowns and closures and mass mandates, even they are going to have to give them up in 2022 because the country is sick and tired of this. Peter Pham had a really good tweet uh, just the other day, maybe you guys can dig it up, where he had a friend visit him from Texas. And they've been living normally there since like July of 2020, roughly. Kids in school, occasionally someone gets sick, but... They've been living normally, okay? It's a manageable problem. And he couldn't believe, uh, Peter's friend could not believe how they're living in LA, where still everyone's living in fear. They've, we now have a new one-month indoor mask mandate, thanks to, you know, Governor Newsom, who still is ruling the state under a state of emergency. What, what good is that going to do? So I think, you know, but, but, but I think that some of these blue areas, people are so petrified still, of yeah. the virus. And I think it's just because of 
they're the ones who have been ingesting all this fear porn coming from the media. And but I but I think it's going to break. I think the the finally this hysteria and panic will break. It'll crest over the blue parts of the country in 2022. They're already back to normal in the red parts, and especially Omicron. You can't stop this. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, think that's the, the the salient point here. Nothing it's, it's works. You're all going to get it. Look, the, 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 the little the little stupid vax card that you have to show everywhere to get like popcorn <laughs> at, at a movie theater, like in, you know, in San Francisco, it doesn't do anything because vaccinated people can spread it too. So that doesn't do anything. And the mass mandate doesn't do anything, um, you know, and so none of this stuff does anything except getting a vaccine reduces the severity of the illness. And if losing you get weight, it. Sachs. And losing weight. And we can't have that conversation. Those, things, those consequences are mainly on the person who decides to do That's it. That's what we I, have to say is we just have to tell everybody, you know, listen, lose weight, get in shape, eat healthy, get vaccinated, get back to life. That's it. That's the best you can do. I'm, I believe everybody's going to get it. We're, we're starting to see like a real divergence in American life where, and I think Omicron's, if we have lockdowns under Omicron, and really the, the big issue is school closures. If we go back to school closures in blue states oh. and have more of the learning loss that Jamath was talking about, and I bet we do, whereas in red states, they're still out there learning normally and they're dealing with it, just like they deal with the outbreak of a flu season or cold season, but they, you know, they're just managing it. We're going to, there's going to be, we're going to be living in two different Americas, but I, but I don't believe this is sustainable. I think eventually these governors who are holding on to their power and their restrictions are going to lose in 2022. The ones who haven't given it up are going to, are going to basically uh, fall to a red wave in November 22. I think Noosa might be the only one Have left any standing. Any schools closed? I see everybody's canceling their Christmas parties. JP Morgan canceled that. We're San close. Francisco. We're close. Every Christmas party has been getting canceled. Um, and I wonder if schools, I mean, teachers unions, I think they got to be having a meeting right now. They don't even, they, the teachers unions don't even acknowledge that learning loss exists. I mean, this is why point. I decided to homeschool for the year of the pandemic. And I kept my homeschool teacher for, you know, a couple of hours a day. And uh, my kids have done wonderfully. And it's great to have the ability to afford to be able to do that. But not everybody can. Have an after school tutor. Let me up level this for a second. Okay. So I'll, uh, maybe I'm spilling the beans on one of my predictions I'll make at the predictions episode we do. But first we had COVID. Okay. Then we had the overreaction to COVID, both politically and economically. Economically, we pumped 10 trillion plus of spending and monetary and QE and all this sort of stuff. Politically, we had these restrictions, school closures, lockdowns, mandates. Okay. I think we're about to enter a new phase, which is the correction to the overreaction. And I think we're already in the correction. So the market's been correcting, growth stocks been correcting for the last five or six weeks. I now think that we're, th there was a bit of a political correction with Youngkin winning in Virginia. Remember that state swung 10 points relative to a year ago. And I think you'll see a further correction, both political and economic in 2022. Yeah, so we may not be completely past COVID, but I think we are going to be past this sort of overreaction to COVID. What do you guys think about Succession? Oh, no, I haven't seen it. I haven't okay, seen okay, it. Okay, 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 don't okay, say okay. anything. Jeremy I'm Strong. Not. Jeremy Strong. Let's talk about the <laughs> Jeremy Strong thing. Jeremy Strong. Okay, Jeremy Strong is a weirdo, uh, according to a New Yorker profile, and there's been a huge response to it. Uh, this profile this came is Kendall, out. Kendall Roy on Succession. Kendall Roy, who is woke and dumb and ineffective as an executive. And obviously, the show is modeled after Rupert Murdoch and Fox and the kids there who are not dopey, actually. In the article, it hinted that most of Secession's co-workers dislike him due to his intensity and mething acted, uh, me method acting rituals. He won't rehearse with anybody. He's in character all the time, like Daniel Day-Lewis. He won't get makeup whenever anybody else does because he doesn't want to reduce the energy and the buildup. Uh, the article notes there is a fine line that Strong walks between being a legendary method actor and just a complete uh, Lee Awesome networker. Wait, can I tell you why this story was interesting to me and why I sent Go this ahead. to you guys? Yeah. Okay, so here's a guy who in many ways is a virtuoso. And the reason, I mean, he's a, he's a really good actor because I despise Kendall Roy on that show. Uh, and I was wondering, like, is this guy just a terrible actor? Or is he such a good actor that I hate them? Yes, I hate him. And that's why I was attracted to this article and in it or after it. So basically, what happens is he's a virtuoso just and I'll come back to it in a second. 
these people at the New Yorker, who I guess are just jealous or want to write clickbait, try to destroy this guy. But what they didn't factor is that when they published this article, all these other actors would come to his defense and do it really publicly. Yes, Anne Hathaway, Anne uh, Hathaway Jessica, Jessica Chastain, Chastain, Aaron Sorkin wrote a letter. Exactly, that Jessica Chastain published to Twitter because Aaron, Aaron Sorkin doesn't have access to social media <laughs> by design. Yeah. And in all of it, they said, this is the most incredible person we've seen. Aaron Sorkin says, this guy is as good as Dustin Hoffman, mm. which is like, that's just- As good as it gets. So why was it interesting to me? It's, you have these people who are grinding mm. and trying to perfect their craft, be a virtuoso. You talked about Steph Curry grinding, try to perfect his craft. Just a right. little Steph Curry story as a tangent. He, he brought in this team where they basically started to map out all of the uh, circumferences of the ring, of the, of the net. And he practiced this summer, literally trying to get it perfectly in to create this very specific kind of swish. And he just kept shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting, not, you know, all the time, but every day for some number of shots, trying to get the ball perfectly ah. into the basket. That is a level of perfectionism. And it, that's being a virtuoso that none of us can really appreciate. But you see the output and we all love it. He's already the goat and he's trying to outdo himself. Here's a different guy in a completely different theater, or in this case acting, trying to also be really legendary and putting himself through all kinds of stuff and still not lose himself in it, okay? Mm -hmm. So much so that all of these other people will really appreciate how amazing he is. And to me, what I don't like is that then these critics who don't do anything, who've never accomplished anything at all in their lives, feel, judgment. feel so triggered that they have to judge him. It's yeah. one thing to not have that skill. I'll never be as good of an actor as Jeremy Strong. I'll never be as good of a ba basketball player as Steph. But I don't hate these people for that. Mm. I'm so happy that people like this exist. But there's a strain of people that exist. And then, who also have a, and then who also have a platform. Karen. Yeah, look, I was about to connect the dots for you. Is <laughs> like, look at, yeah, look at how the politicians feel the same way about media, private market. Media, politicians, yeah. social media. Who decide media to try addicts. to destroy people? Yeah. So instead, what these people do is they take a shortcut. They're the critics. They're not in the arena. Okay. The folks in the arena are booking wins and losses constantly. It's but you have, this, you have this strain of impotent critic. Whoop that doesn't naturally know how to do for themselves. And they somehow have a platform. And then what they end up doing is cutting corners. And then some subset of those start to cheat. Q David. Well, yeah, it's a story that it, Congress back in 2012 passed a bill called the Stock Act to prohibit uh, members of Congress from trading on their insider knowledge based on, you know, based on legislative actions they're about to take. And it's been widely flouted by dozens of, you know, representatives and senators. And the problem is there's no punishment. It's something like a $200 fine or something like that that gets waived uh, in most of these cases. So it's completely hypocritical because these are the, these politicians like Senator Karen, they're constantly demonizing and attacking other people to make themselves look better. And then here they are, they've got dirty hands. Um, and they asked Pelosi, they said to Pelosi, well, don't you think that Members of Congress should be prohibited from trading stocks, right? Because their actions have such a huge consequence on them. And Pelosi said, no, it's a, it's a free market. It's a free market. We should be free to, to do that. It's like, huh, you know, I don't remember that being a defense every time you've wanted to regulate some, you know, industry that, uh, that, also, that you didn't Sachs, think. Also, doesn't the mm -hmm. president have to divest when they take the presidential office? Isn't that a thing? Divest or they put, they put their assets trust, in a blind, in a blind trust. trust. Yeah, so they're mm -hmm. blind. So why, why would... Senators, Congress, totally people be any different no, than the it's president. A, it's, it's absurd that elected officials should be able to engage in insider trading. It makes no sense. The Fed uh, actually had this issue as well. Two um, two folks on the Federal Reserve Board resigned, and then Powell issued uh, a whole bunch of, I think, new laws try or regulations inside the Fed to try to fix it. And the same issue occurs with federal judges, and there are federal judges that are consistently trading in the equities of the companies that are in front of them. And so what? how can you how can you adjudicate a case? There was one judge that had 130 plus conflicts, trading conflicts. 130 plus and he is the one that's there where AT&T or Facebook or Google has an issue. I mean, how can you actually assume that these folks are being impartial if that's the case? And there are no consequences for this. 
And yet, you know, if you're, again, going back to where we started, somebody in the arena trying to do something, you, you just got to think to yourself, like, you have critics that are bashing you, you have folks that are basically flouting the law because they can, and then you put these two together, and it's like, this is so, it's kind of depressing, to be honest with you. You, you start to They're lose a little grifters, bit of faith in the system. Let's be honest. I mean, these, these politicians are grifters. That's it. And full stop. I mean, they're just grifting. And I mean, except for apparently, except for Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they should just buy the companies they hate. Why aren't they buying Amazon and Tesla? They would be total proponents of Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk if they did. Yeah. In fairness to Warren, I've seen her tweet that she supports the banning of the insider trading by congressional oh. representatives, but I don't exactly see her fighting for it, uh, mm. you know, as hard as she's denouncing people like Elon. So, um, look, I mean, it's it's characteristic of, of elected officials that they, um, what is it, they see the the splinter, you know, in somebody, you know, in somebody else's eye, but not the the log in their own or something like that. Isn't that the expression? But, you know, who's taking advantage of this issue is Blake Masters, who's running for the Senate in Arizona, just tweeted about that this would be the first thing he would fix if he gets elected, which is to ban insider trading by elected officials. And I, I think it's remarkable that, you know, politicians as shrewd as Nancy Pelosi are just ceding this issue to Republicans. I mean, I don't know why Republicans wouldn't make this a major plank of their platform for 2022. David, Nancy Pelosi is, I think, the third or fourth richest person in Congress. Her husband is a very sophisticated private equity investor. There are these meme stocks that follow Nancy Pelosi's stock trading account or pretend to that were, <laughs> you know, recently, by the way, banned by Twitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was weird. Her. Yeah. Protecting her. Protecting, Protecting her, her effectively. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she has an incentive to not. Her seat of power is not necessarily the salary that she earns by being house leader, but it's by translating that in a bunch of different ways. And one way, apparently, it turns out, is being an active equity investor in the market. It's unbelievable that's allowed. I don't know how this isn't just like an A-plus fantastic issue for Such Republicans. They should make it an absolute plank of their platform. Well, here we go. Florida Republican Brian Mast uh, was late in disclosing, disclosing the purchase of up to 100000 in stock in an aerospace company which had just testified before a committee, he says. Kentucky Republican Rand Paul was 16 months late disclosing that he bought, his wife bought stock in a pharma company that manufactures an antiviral COVID-19 treatment. Right. Nevada Democrat Susie Lee failed to probably disclose more than 200 trades. Yeah, worth just to as be much clear. as 3 million. I mean, this is Yeah, bonkers. just to be clear, the violations have been on both sides of the aisle. I'm yes. not at all trying to say that Republicans are better on this than Democrats. No, this, However, this is good. I this is not, good bipartisan cooperation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's ridiculous. This is the political class in Washington no engaging records. in bad behavior. But 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 the difference is this, which is that Pelosi, uh, the only leader of a party I've heard defend this is Pelosi. And I think this is a fantastic issue for outsider candidates, really on both sides, to run on. Well, this is, this is also something that Biden can take because Biden has never tried to do this stuff. You know? Oh, my God. Biden's got so many shady dealings and conflicts. Uh, are you talking no, about no, his kid no. selling paintings to China? Or There's a lot him? of rich Bidens out there. Apparently, he's got a rich brother. He's got a you know, no, hunter who's no, been paid no, a lot of money. No, no, no. no, no maybe no. that's hunter true. Just but Joe Biden has been really down yeah. the middle. Come on, be, be fair. Hunter's brilliant. I mean, he's selling paintings. Yeah, but why are they buying Hunter Biden paintings for five hundred thousand dollars? Well, I mean, he's a great artist. I mean, why do people <laughs> buy? I don't know if you saw Melania's coming out with NFTs today. <laughs> so she's okay, Melania's. So. Secu everybody's securing the bag now. I mean, if and by the way, the presidential grift is always the best. Just as a case in point, Trump's SPAC is worth over two billion. And BuzzFeed, which makes three hundred sixty million a year, and I think has a hundred, two hundred million in cash, is yeah, worth but like six hundred. He's not an office. He's not an office. That's misstated, Jason. Trump's SPAC, his shares that he's going to be receiving, are worth close to twenty billion. What? Twenty billion. But he's not in office anymore, so I'm the not sure. The that shares that he's going to receive. Oh, the, in the future. Is, yeah, the, 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 what you're counting is the market cap of the cash and trust, the value ah, of the shares that are right, already right, public right, right, in the SPAC. You. Right. The, the Trump, the value of the Trump entity is going to be closer to twenty billion. Oh, is that right? Wow, that's even yeah. crazier with no revenue. These poor media no re yeah, people. The, well, um, the SEC apparently the DOJ sent a bunch of inquiries on this, asking uh, for background on the transaction because there's no business, there's no contracts, there's no employees. It's just a whole. But by the way, idea just, just to make sure that everybody understands this is this is a bipartisan thing as well. The the ultimate bag secures the Obamas got. I think 
50 million plus each for their book deals. And they got supposedly high eight figures, like 50, 60, 70, 80 million dollars from Netflix. Sorry, hold on a second. Hold on a second. When you said, when you call them bag securers, I was really triggered there for a second. So am I supposed to take that offensively that you're saying Michelle Obama and Barack Obama secured the bag? Secured the bag is a term for getting the money. The, the okay. Obamas okay. So are doing I, I, it. Okay. The so Clintons it's just a, did it. And right, it's a thing. Trump's it's just doing a thing. It. It's right, a thing. It's Secure a thing. the it's bag. Thing. But, but okay. Jason, we're, we're not against everybody not be able to make money. Uh, the issue is trading on your office in a way that uh, where you are trading on your insider information that your office has given sure, you. Sure, but I mean that, here- Or if you're selling influence. If you sell a book, hold on a second. If you sell a book when you're out of office, is that really a problem? Is that on no, the no. same thing? I wanted thing? to point out the Netflix one. What was Netflix's existential crisis for the eight years Obama was in office? Anybody remember? Nobody remembers. Net neutrality. Nobody cares. Could they get, would they have to pay Verizon? What was uh, the Obama's position on net neutrality? They were for net neutrality. Netflix stock went up 40, 50 X under Obama. It could all be a coincidence. I'm just saying. What the fuck? So you're saying it's like, you're saying it's a disguised lobbying payment to Obama. I think it's like, are you serious? I think it's like uh, you are I think out of your mind. Soul. I mean, I, listen, the Clintons were doing speaking gigs for Goldman Sachs so, at half a million um, dollars. This is kind of my cue to go to dinner now. <laughs> okay, so the, here's the, the MRA. And then. You know, the main way that Winston Churchill supported himself was writing books. I think it's okay for politicians to write books, and if because ultimately the public buys them, and that's how they make money. What about when the book is fifty million and the normal price would be ten? That's the problem. Well, I mean, if I, I guess you might have a point. If the advance was so in excess of the expected yes. sales that it raises a question of what the Correct. real motive That's is what I'm for the payment. About. But I don't. But is that is that what happened? Is that nobody true? gets paid a fifty million dollar advance. Nobody gets an eight figure deal who's never sell? made a documentary before. No, I mean, if this book sold five million copies, it still wouldn't be worth it. Uh, let's move on to mRNA so we keep our freed uh, free bird factor high. <laughs> I'm, like so, I'm like so, I'm so ready to go to dinner. Rick Thompson gave me a wonderful bottle of wine. By the way, I'm going to go drink oh, it tonight. I'm yeah. so bird. super tilted that you're, you, 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 like it's like. I mean, what? Because I, I, I criticize the Obamas. Yeah, I can't deal with you. It. Can't do so that <laughs> no, it's a no fly zone for I'm you. I'm super tilted. I mean, this is worse than sweater, Karen. What what about the Clintons? Can I can I uh, go after their 500k speaking gigs from yeah. Goldman Sachs? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, okay, fine. Just don't uh, touch the Obamas. But I mean, <laughs> Jason, are you are you doing exactly what Senator Karen did to Elon, which yeah. is by virtue of the fact that they're making money that no, you no, are I now imputing evil motives to it? No, it's just a disproportionate to what they should get. Paid. By your assessment, their assessment's the same about Elon. I pay a lot of money for Michelle Obama to do much of anything. I think she's Eight just a figure deal for badass. somebody who's never made a film uh, for Netflix. Who cares? I don't think you, it makes you, sense. You, you, you said the same thing about Rivian. I don't know, man. You're projecting a little bit. I, I totally agree. Oh, God, if, if this is on the you, second floor, I jump out the window right now. Yeah, you let, uh, <laughs> let winners be winners, I think, J. Cal. I, I, just, I think we should differentiate between insider trading, sure, bad and should not be allowed, influence peddling, bad should not be allowed. And somebody out of office making monetizing money. their influence. Exactly. Yeah. Well, no, no, not monetizing their influence. They're, and they're, if they did that, that's fame. a problem. Getting paid for but services is getting, fine. Getting paid to sell tickets or books. That's if that's, that's what fine. it is. That's fine. Unless it's, totally it's fine. disproportionate to the reality. Let's put it. Okay, we'll fine. Put a pin in it. Put a pin in it. MRNA. No. Wait. No. 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 Jason, say you like the Obamas or I like the Obamas. I would vote Obama in for a third term. Okay. Didn't you get paid a fifty thousand dollars speaking fee recently to speak at a conference? He did. Overpaid. 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 You're worth eight eight dollars and fifty cents in a fucking subway sandwich. You're worth like twenty five hundred dollars. I just got paid fifteen grand to do a fifty minute speaking Who are you trying to influence? Who are they paying you to influence, J. Cal? I mean, honestly, J. Cal. I have no influence. Jason, Jason, you're worth like like thirty percent less than a high end escort. Okay, no offense. Oh man, that's six hundred bucks. I don't know. Seven hundred bucks. There's a high end influence. Are you saying? What's 30% more than 50? You're saying it's like 80 grand. <laughs> and that's, I don't know, 60, 70 grand. I didn't realize that. Um, all right. Talk to us about the mRNA news for cancer, Freebird, that came out this past week. So I think the article that you guys sent around was one related to uh, an oncology treatment that uses mRNA tech. But I, I think it's what, what I wanted to kind of what I thought would be interesting to talk about for a second is just zooming out on mRNA technology as a whole. Um, which, you know, has been theorized for, you know, the, 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 the potential of it's been talked about for 50 years. Um, if we talk about real quick what, what RNA is, remember your DNA, your genetic code, uh, 
you know, defines um, the, uh, uh, the printing of proteins in your cells. And so every three letters of DNA is, is an amino acid, a bunch of amino acids in a, in a row form a protein, and that protein has some function in your body. The way that the DNA gets translated into protein is through these mRNA snippets. So uh, a little snippet of RNA is a copy of DNA, which floats over from the DNA strand, and it floats into what's called the ribosome, and the ribosome is the protein printer in the cell. And there's lots of ribosomes, and there's lots of RNA floating around all the time, and it's being copied over. So some chemical triggers the expression of that gene, of that sequence of DNA into RNA, that then turns into protein. And so a chemical induces the protein, then the protein does something interesting. And the protein has a function in your body. And some of those proteins in human body can, you know, do bad things, and some of them can do good things. And so the idea has always been that we can actually use proteins as a way to modulate our health and modulate disease. For example, creating a protein that can attach to cancer cells and signal immune cells to come and kill those cancer cells, as an example. And some people have genetic problems where their DNA prints the wrong protein. And then that protein is malformed or causes some harm to your health. And so the idea for RNA technology has always been that instead of having DNA be the source of truth for the proteins that get expressed in your body, can we stick RNA directly into cells and use that RNA to trigger the production of proteins that can do specific things in your body? And remember, the biggest segment of the pharma market or a huge segment of the pharma market is what's called biologic drugs, which are largely antibodies, which are a type of protein that have some specific function. But very many of these proteins are hard to get into the body and get them into the right place and get them to do the things we want them to do. So it would be a lot easier if we could get RNA into the right cells to get those cells to make the right protein to do that thing that we want them to do. Mm -hmm. So everything from cancer treatment to genetic diseases, um, uh, and there's RNA interference and there's um, RNA or what are called oligonucleotides that can be used to block specific bad proteins from being produced in your cells um, or it's kind of another kind of course of treatment. So making proteins that we think are therapeutic and blocking the production of bad proteins are kind of the, the mainstay of this idea behind RNA technology. And Moderna was started to pursue this effort out of flagship pioneering, which is an incubation shop in, in, in Boston. Um, and they really kind of struggled for years to find the right footing of what's the right business model and the right product and the, and the FDA kind of struggled with approving this stuff. And then boom, COVID hit. And when COVID hit, it was like, holy crap, let's accelerate this RNA technology, use it for vaccines, which had been in development for years. And the protein that's being produced is the same protein you find on the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which triggers an immune response and builds up your immunity to that virus. And now the floodgates are open. And this is incredible because the frontiers in RNA over the next decade could change the course of how we treat disease um, and change the course of, um, uh, of outcomes for many diseases from genetic diseases all the way through to cancers. Mm. Um, and so we're starting to see those floodgates open. I think there's now a few, a handful of these, uh, you know, uh, RNA interference um, products that have been approved by the FDA. And we're now starting to see many more of these cancer and immunotherapy drugs start to get approved uh, as RNA um, uh, therapies. But it really, uh, I think, was lit by, um, uh, by the breakthrough with COVID and everyone kind of seeing the benefit of this and the lack of side effects. And we've now got, uh, I think, a validation in the market and acceptance from consumers that this technology could transform the industry in the same way that Genentech transformed the pharma industry with biologic drugs in the um, 80s and 90s. So it's super exciting. Um, and, you know, we, we can do updates regularly on our show if you guys want to talk about more of the cool stuff that's coming out. But man, this is going to transform how medicine is delivered and, and the potential of things that we can kind of treat. Let me ask you a question. Would the if we looked at the total number of deaths from COVID and then the potential debt, you know, deaths avoided or early deaths or more life days added, however you want to do it from mRNA and the impact on cancer? over the next, say, 30, 40 years, in other words, the impact it would have on the people living today who live through COVID. Do you think net net, uh, we'll see that the prevention of cancers through this new technology could actually make, you know, uh, basically the silver lining to what happened during COVID? It's a good question. Um, let me give you the counterpoint. Uh, in the late 90s, there was a, a gene editing um, clinical trial that took place. And they tried to, uh, and, and a patient, and they, and they delivered the gene editing technology via virus. And so the virus goes in, it spreads around, and it, and it has this, this, this molecule that would edit the gene, and, and, and it was for a genetic disease. 
And a patient that they gave it to, a young guy, got this uh, this virus and he actually died from it. And they shut down all clinical trials wow. for years. And it was like, boom, that's the end. So um, there, there are a lot of scientists, a lot of doctors have argued for years that that particular case caused so many lives to be lost because we lost years of progress in being able to run clinical trials during that time and get drugs to market that could treat people. And you're right, maybe the opposite has happened here, that while these clinical trials may have taken years and years and years to get through in a normal setting, perhaps the pandemic was the accelerant we needed to mm. get more of these to market faster and millions of people whose lives would have been lost or would be lost otherwise to cancer and other uh, genetic diseases and so on over the years to come will be saved because these therapies will get to market faster. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. And, and maybe I don't know what the calculus is between the lives lost in the pandemic versus the lives gained via these treatments coming to market faster. But it's, it's certainly a good way I mean, to the, think about it. The, the, the way to look at it, we can look at the days of life lost, right? And if we actually could actually predict how long somebody's gonna live. And the, you know, extension of life, I, I think we can come out of this ahead. Uh, finally, on our docket, London Bree calls for better policing in San Francisco after this insane surge in crime. Here's the video. And it's time that the reign of criminals who are destroying our city, it is time for it to come to an end. And it comes to an end when we take the steps to be more aggressive with law enforcement, more aggressive with the changes in our policies, and less tolerant of all the bullshit that has destroyed our city. We are gonna turn this around. This is a city that has a population of less than 1 million people with an over $12 billion budget. The residents of this city have been extremely generous in providing us with the resources we need to make a difference. And now the priorities we need to make must be to protect them, must be to turn things around in their neighborhoods. When you are in a room full of people, I would say probably anywhere between 90 and 95 percent of folks could raise their hand and say that either their car has been breaking into, broken into, or they've been a victim in some capacity or another. That is not okay. That is not acceptable. Sachs, I thought crime was down and that everything was great <laughs> and that we were going to defund the police. What is happening here? What, what's the big turnaround? Well, it's, it's exactly what I was saying that, well, first of all, I loved it. I love what she said. It's yeah. exactly what I've been saying for the last year. And it's really great to hear her say the same types of things. I started this, this campaign back in January after yeah. New Year's Eve. You had those two women uh, get killed by a Murdered. repeat offender who was released by Chase Boudin. And then as I dug into it, I saw that he was doing this all the time as part of his agenda of decarceration. So, and, you know, a year later, it, like we've talked about throughout this, this whole time, I mean, the city has totally degenerated into some sort of dystopian Gotham-like city. Uh, this did feel like the beginning of a Batman movie. I mean, yeah. it was a strong statement. I thought it was great. This is just the beginning of what needs to be done. I predict that London Breed is going to eventually butt heads with Chase Boudin. There is no way that he will support this agenda of fixing the city. She wants to inc increase the police presence. So like you said, she is going to refund the police, not defund the police. Chase Boudin is, I mean, the only people he's passionate about prosecuting are police officers. Yeah. So we have a huge problem that the police department is actually, we have too few of them. We're understaffed. We would take that job. It's not just because of budget. It's also because they're demoralized and yeah. they've got, you know, they've got this prosecutor. By the way, there was a case just recently where um, a repeat offender bashed a vodka ball over the head of a cop and the chase had just announced that he's getting sent to mental health diversion instead of being prosecuted i want to what you post can attack this. Yeah. a cop and not go to jail in the city of san francisco yes yes this is why the cops are demoralized so in order for london Bree to fix the problem she is going and i think she's on Justice's the right track go. here he's got to go so here's my prediction on february 15th they are having the recall election for the education board and I predict that that board, at least two of the three are going to be recalled. The parents are sick and, ti are sick and tired of it. Yeah. They are going to be out. I think that's going to embolden London Bree to then support the recall of Chase Boudin in the June wow. election. And, and I think between- And she gets to pick his replacement when it's recalled. Yes, exactly. So, so I, that's what she's doing. She basically flipped. She was quiet up until this point. Uh, and the now progressive left are slowly eating themselves.
Yeah, I mean, I think this is self-preservation, right, Shamath? I mean, if she didn't make a change here, she's going to be out of office too. She'll get recalled. It's not self-preservation. They're realizing that these policies don't work. Mm. Moral absolutism didn't work on the left or the right. These guys have tried in a small scale to do what a certain fraction of the Democratic Party has been trying to do at a national level. It doesn't work. Overspending, under-policing, under-educating, it doesn't do anything. There, I think there is going to be a schism. I think it started after uh, the Youngkin victory in Virginia, and I think it's going to accelerate throughout for the next year, and especially after the red wave in November 2022. There's going to be a schism between liberal pragmatists and these extreme radical progressives. I think um, London Breed represents, she's obviously very liberal, but I think she's pragmatic. I think she wants to find solutions that work. Whereas Chase Boudin is a radical ideologue who will never change no, much, no matter how much evidence is presented to him that his policies don't work Free and are backfiring. Bird. I think um, there's a simple formula. The person who gets you into the mess is likely not the right person to get you out of the mess. And, um, well said, you know, she, she talks about San Francisco having a $12 billion a year budget. Can you guys imagine if she was the CEO of a tech company that had $12 billion a year in OPEX and she ran the business into the ground? Would the board say, go ahead, turn it around? Absolutely not. The board would step in. And in this case, the board is the citizens of San Francisco. And they would say, let's find the right person to turn this thing around. And while she stood up and said the right things, and, and may, maybe it would echo. And I think, you know, even if it echoes within S David Sachs's heart, I'm sure it's echoing in a lot of hearts of more liberal San Franciscans. Um, but I think that the apathy, being asleep at the wheel, and allowing the um, disorganization across the departments within that city is ultimately her responsibility. And I don't think that any amount of, you know, verbiage or action she might take at this point justifies the damage she has caused while being the leader of that city. There and I think that you'll, and, and by the way, I think you'll see to Sachs's point earlier, I think you'll see the same response across the nation where folks feel like the, the leaders that got them into the mess that they're in locally in cities and, and elsewhere around this country are going to vote those folks out of office. Um, because they want to change. And it's the same reason we saw folks vote Trump into office and the same reason we saw folks vote Trump out of office. The more you want to see a change, the more you're going to make a change with your Confidence. political electorate. So right. Friedberg is so, so right. There is a phenomenal Twitter account. And his name is Rob Henderson. And he's like a PhD student right now. I think he's in Europe on scholarship. You know, he's this, 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 kid, this guy has, a, has an incredible background, which you can talk about later. But Rob Henderson has this thing which I love, which is that, you know, a lot of this stuff is born out of what he calls luxury beliefs, right? Like defunding totally. the police is a luxury totally. belief. If you're like this rich middle class cloistered person that can sit behind a gate, have armed security, yada, 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 because you're not living in the ghetto where the byproducts of the byproduct of defunding the police are born out or decarceration are born out. Or, you know, if you send your kid to a private school, you can completely be for all these crazy radical ideas like defunding, you know, advanced placement, defunding the gifted program, because if your kid's smart, you'll just pay for a tutor and you can do whatever you want. Those luxury beliefs exist more in the progressive left in such a small cohort of people than in any other political class that we have in America. Mm. And when they get a hold of power, they've now had the right to show whether those luxury beliefs can actually work, the data says it doesn't. Okay? Let's go with competence. I mean, how about that? Like, just keep people safe and make the education These system. These luxury better. beliefs belong in sociolo sociology textbooks, in yeah. anthropological articles. They, they, they're, they're better off in like where beatnik smoke pot and talk about it over a glass of wine. Let me clean up something just... So, look, I have no special desire to defend London Breed. I'm sure there are many. Uh, <laughs> I, knew that, I, knew, I knew that I hit a nerve. No, look, I'm sure there are many better Sachs, people. are you, you wearing as, a as London mayor. Breed brand sweater? Is that, yeah. is that Tom Tom London Ford. Breed? Tom Ford. <laughs> Tom Ford. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Tom Ford, Tom Ford. Tom Ford, Tom Ford. Look, I, I'm sure there are better mayors, but um, d just to, I, I, think, I think we have to sort of temper what you said based on the realities of politics in San Francisco, which are, which are this. We actually have a weak mayor. The mayor can't do anything yeah. without a vote, right? without the vote of the right. board of supervisors. Right. And the soups are controlled right now by a bunch of crazies Wackos, who are basically Dean allies. Preston. 
Dean Preston and Matt Haney, Matt Haney and Hillary and Rodin, who are who are allies of Chase Boudin. Okay, so London Breed, I think, wants to do some good things. I think that she is more pragmatic than these ideologues. I think that she could have been more aggressive and more outspoken about standing up to them. However, earlier. Yeah. earlier okay, but I think she is now doing the right thing in terms of the speech she just gave, basically mm. calling for refunding the police and we're sick of the bullshit and we're going to take action. Those are the right things to be saying right now. She did the right thing in terms of supporting the recall of this school board. And what I'm saying is let's give her a chance to see if yeah, she does come agreed. out 100%, in favor 100%. of the recall of Chase Boudin because I think that's where it's headed. And if she gets on board with that and she shows she's pragmatic, she may actually survive well, you say, this well, red you wave that's coming. Will you do a fundraiser coming. if she gets out it's of It's happening all around the country, right? We saw Bill de Blasio, who was the first real progressive leftist elected Dummy. to a major city. Incompetent. He completely ran New York City into the ground. Now Eric Adams is going to go clean it up, right? We had Glenn Youngkin, who basically ran a centrist campaign take over Virginia. It's over. It's Just over, Johnny. Let's call it. It's over. Game centrism, over. pragmatism. Enough of these extreme polar opposites, okay? Right. Let, let Antifa and the Proud Boys go and make love to each other in some <laughs> deserted island. It's over. It's done. Let's uh, stop talking about it. That was the funniest thing it. I heard. Somebody said to me, like, Proud Boys and um, what's the other group? Oath Keepers or something? They, they, this uh, woman who's gay said, <laughs> she's like, oh, you know, it was Rachel Maddow. She's like, I think these are like gay activist groups, aren't they? Like, Proud Boys? It sounds like a gay activist group. <laughs> I think we're seeing the the correction of the overreaction, the pandemic cause, what, what Neil Ferguson calls pandemic politics, that we that the pandemic bred a strain of radical politics that we saw all over the country. And I think on both that, sides. Uh, um, and I think the country is gonna come out of that. Did you see these idiots go to Cheesecake Factory and do a sit-in without their masks on? Uh, and that that's their form of protest is like, we're going to go into the Cheesecake Factory. Who are you talking about? It was a Cheesecake Factory protest. Uh, and now it's going national with people who are anti-mask, anti-vax. They don't want to have to show their cards or wear a mask when they walk to their seat. So they're literally doing sit-ins at Cheesecake Factory. And I was like, I would protest going to a Cheesecake Factory. I, I'm not going to protest in a Cheesecake Factory. It's well, s some people aren't on a diet like you, Jake, and they enjoy cheesecake. Ah, well, where are you at? What's the number? <laughs> Sachs, just give us the number. What's your I'm weight like today? I'm around 170. I'm 174. So I'm right, I'm, right, I'm coming you're, right you're, up behind you. You hear right the there. steps? You hear the Saxy, right Saxy, I'm going to tell you, bro, I love your sweater. I'm going to drive to the city, come to the mausoleum and make love to you with that sweater on. Oh my God. All right, everybody. We'll see you next week on the love All you boys. In Podcast. Love you, besties. Love, love you, Sax. Love you, Sax. Back at you. We'll let your winners ride. Rain Man David Sachs. Source it to the fans, and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West Side Queen of Kinwa. Besties are back. Go That's my uh, dog taking a notice in your driveway. <laughs> Be. What? <laughs> That's gonna be a, we need to get merch. Are I'm back. going all in.